The views expressed on The Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw Radio, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. You can also podcast us on iTunes, and if you do, please rate us on there. You can also follow us on social medias. We have a Facebook page, which is The Final Straw Radio. You can also follow us on Instagram at The Final Straw Radio. Um, also, if you are interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you are free to do so. Just send us an email so we know you're doing it. And if you care to, you can send us snail mail at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville, specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. Before we get into the show's content, I wanted to briefly announce that the Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons, or FTP, has just announced that their 2017 convergence will be from June 2nd through 5th this year in Denton, Fort Worth, Texas. It will include speakers, panels, workshops, protests, and cultural activities, including an art show and hip-hop performances. Some proposed topics are mapping toxic prisons, the history and future of June 11th, which is the International Day of Solidarity with Anarchist Prisoners, and building multiracial alliances against incarceration. If you want to learn more about the Campaign to Fight Toxic Prisons, you can go to their website, fighttoxicprisons.org. And you can also hear an interview that we did with them by going to thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and just searching Fight Toxic Prisons. This week I spoke with Jude Ortiz, a member of the Tilted Scales Collective and co-author of A Tilted Guide to Being a Defendant, recently published by Combustion Books. For the hour, we talk about the new guide, strategizing collective legal and political defense, the dangers of cooperation with the criminal court system, and more. You can find out more about the collective as well as more of their writings at tiltedscalescollective.org. But first, here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? We're caught like a boy! Here at Warren Corruptional, I'm involved in a book club that was organized by a retired professor who formerly taught here. Her name is Gloria Flaherty. Gloria marched with Martin Luther King in the 1960s and still advocates for peace and for the leftism that emerged from that era. If you ever want to hear an 80-year-old former professor string together colorful obscenities, some of them in Italian, all you have to do is press her buttons by implying that Donald Trump might know what he's doing. Gloria introduces reading selections to our book club and then facilitates our discussions. Some of the prior books include Fran Spano's Black Skin, White Masks, about colonization from a black colonial perspective, and Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming. During my 50-day hunger strike, I missed out on To Kill a Mockingbird. I've done my best to get Gloria to give up on the hierarch delusion and jump to our side of the barricades, joining the ski mask and dumpster fire crowd, so far to no success. Feel free to send her literature. I hope someone out there can introduce her to a zine I co-wrote called Last Act of the Circus Animals. If we're going to convert her, we'd better hurry. She's in her 80s, so we likely only have a couple of decades, which is probably longer than the time we have before the Atrumpolis takes us back to the next Neolithic anyway and turns all of us into anarchists. At any rate, the latest selection for the book club was Ellie Wiesel's Night which recounts his experience as a young Jewish teen surviving the concentration camps of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Wiesel, who died not too long ago, was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and I highly recommend this selection, which can probably be found wherever good books are stolen. 
In the book, Diesel manages to introduce the events of mass extermination without judgment. To his great credit, he presents to the reader what happened and lets us feel whatever it is that we feel, rather than imposing his own feelings on the subject matter. Early in the story, Wiesel introduces the character of Moishe the Beetle, a poor and somewhat curious character in his hometown, who was rounded up for expulsion because he was a foreigner. Moishe was crammed onto a cattle car and taken away. Shortly after, Moishe the Beetle returned, telling the Jewish population of his town that everyone who had been expelled with him had been exterminated. Once taken to Polish territory, the Gestapo had ordered everyone to dig huge trenches and were then summarily shot, falling into the mass grave they themselves had dug. He described infants tossed into the air and used as target practice for machine guns. Moshe himself had been shot but only wounded and plagued dead until he made his escape so he could warn the Jews of his hometown what was in store. To quote from the book, Day after day, night after night, he went from one Jewish house to the next, telling his story and that of Malka, the young girl who lay dying for three days, and that of Toby, the tailor, who begged to die before his sons were killed. Moshe was not the same. The joy in his eyes was gone. He no, he no longer mentioned either God or Kabbalah. He spoke only of what he had seen, but people not only refused to believe his tales, they refused to listen. Some even insinuated that he had only wanted their pity, that he was imagining things. Others flatly said that he had gone mad. Even I did not believe him. I often sat with him after services and listened to his tales, trying to understand his grief. But all I felt was pity. You don't understand, he said in despair. You cannot understand. I was saved miraculously. I succeeded in coming back. Where did I get my strength? I wanted to return to Saget to describe to you my death, so that you might ready yourselves while there is still time. Life? I no longer care to live. I am alone. But I wanted to come back to warn you. Only no one is listening to me. Time and again, Wiesel describes where he and others were confronted with the truth of the extermination camps, and the great lengths that they went in order not to believe even when facing the crematoria and the sight of infants tossed on the bonfires. Moishe the Beetle moments, where they had opportunities to accept the bewildering reality and take an alternate course of action. It seems to me that we are all experiencing a series of Moishe the Beetle moments. The police violence against Occupy, the Humvees in the streets of Ferguson, the internal sabotage of a socialist Jew running for president, the election of a fascist on a false populist agenda, the expulsion of foreigners, the religious and racial targeting, the surveillance exposed by Snowden and others, the use of torture both foreign and domestic, the slow and incremental methods employed daily that give our world more and more the character of an open-air concentration camp. I am reminded of Derek Jensen's observation that more Jews survived the concentration camps by resisting than by obeying. And I am reminded of the words of Mayor Berliner, who died fighting against the SS at Treblinka death camp. When the oppressor gives you two options, always take the third. How many Moishe the Beatles do we need to scream at us in order to persuade us to run, to hide, to resist? It makes me pause to wonder at who might be the next Ellie Wiesel, who perhaps survives to describe our collective fate, how we stood in the forest with guns to our backs, and in disbelief of the obvious, continued digging the trenches. This is Anarchist President Sean Swain from Warren Corruption in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain, 243-205, Warren C.I., P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org.
We're speaking with Jude Ortiz, a member of the Tilted Scales Collective and co-author of A Tilted Guide to Being a Defendant, recently published by Combustion Books. Thanks a lot for chatting, Jude. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, to be clear, you and your co-authors aren't lawyers. Can you tell the audience a little bit about the work that you do do around legal and prisoner issues and that of the Tilted Scales Collective? Right. So, yeah, nobody in Tilted Scales Collective is a lawyer. We're all legal workers. Uh, we're a very small collective. Uh, so there actually are two of us who are active at this particular moment. And we kind of you know, finish up the book and work with Combustion Books out in New York to get it together and out into the world. Um, but we've been doing legal support for prisoners across the country in a variety of different ways for a good number of years now. Uh, some of that has been working directly with defendants as they go through like, their pretrial process and they either take a plea agreement or go to trial. Uh, some of that has been supporting people like throughout their their incarceration and like upon release. And some of that's been working with legal support efforts across the country for big mobilizations like a Republican National Convention or you know uh, things that happened out recently in D.C. with the inauguration. Like just different things along those veins. Um, so our, we have a overall like a pretty wide like range of experiences, um, and that's kind of the base of how we've approached the work as Tilted Scales Collective. And the collective itself formed after conversations at an Anarchist Black Cross conference in 2012, when we were noticing how effective the state is, like the government is, at using criminal charges to disrupt and destroy political organizing, like in particular, like radical revolutionary organizing. And we wanted to figure out a way of interrupting that process and trying to take away some of the power of the state to use those charges to destroy our organizing. It Does it kind of feel doing this sort of work like you're having the same conversation over and over again? Because that seems that that would make a pretty good reason for publishing a book like this. Like, here's how we see the system. Here's some ideas of struggling. Here's some examples there are so many commonalities and like themes across the country. Like the criminal legal system in the United States is extraordinarily complex and every jurisdiction is different. So every state is different. Federal is different at the federal level. Sometimes like districts, like the different districts can work in different ways. Um, but the thing that's, that runs true throughout is that the state is extremely effective at using those criminal charges to target and isolate and punish people, and also to send a message to everybody around them that resistance has too many consequences and is too scary of a thing. So in that sense, we definitely had very similar conversations with people over the years in lots of different places like across the country. And it's also true that you know the the prison industrial complex is a horrible, like devastating system all across the country. And it's used to repress communities on a daily basis, like kind of day in and day out. And it's also used to target individual like, activists or radicals, like organizers, um, again, like to make that the, um, the example of them. Um, so with in that sense, we definitely had like a lot of similar conversations. And we also saw like on our side, on like the like, radical like, re revolutionary side, seeing people making a lot of the same mistakes or kind of falling victim to a lot of the same tactics of the state in order to force plea agreements, in order to isolate and scare people. And historically, that's led to a lot of people snitching on each other and really destroying movements and communities. But it's also when people have withstood that pressure and have been able to stay true to their principles and their politics, they still pay like enormous costs. And we think overall, like whenever we're engaged in, in radical or revolutionary struggle, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be prison sentences and people facing charges. Um, and we can't totally take those away, particularly with like one collective or one book or anything like that. But we can figure out how to change the way that we handle these things so that we can come out stronger and not let the state be the only one who comes out stronger after these charges. 
So very, and you've already mentioned this, but very present in my mind while reading this book is the mass arrest at around 11 a.m. on January 20th, 2017 in Washington, D.C. The following quote is from the site Dead City Legal Posse, a collective of activists and legal support workers in the District of Columbia. Quote, during the inauguration of Donald, J., or Donald Trump on January 20th, 2017, thousands of activists, journalists, and legal observers descended on the streets of Washington, D.C., to participate in, document, and support the protests and direct actions that erupted all over the city. On that day, more than 200 of those same activists, journalists, and legal observers were indiscriminately kettled on a corner in downtown D.C. Some were held there for nearly 11 hours without food, water, or access to a bathroom before being arrested and charged with felony rioting, which carries up to 10 years in prison and $25,000 in fines. You started in the beginning of the book, saying that the book was not written as a response to any particular case. Um, and I'm not sure how aware you are of what's going on in the aftermath of these arrests, but this seems like the sort of audience you'd be directing the book at. And it's also important to note that the, the book's available for free, right? How how could folks get a hold of copies? Yeah, so we we published the, the book itself in, in the print copy in February of this year. And pretty much immediately after that, we put the free ebook copy up on Combustion Books website. Uh, so people could go to, to combustionbooks.org and look for a tilted guide to being a defendant. Um, people can also go to tiltedscalescollective.org. And from there, you can get you know, links to the publisher's website to find the free ebook. And if people are interested in the ideas in the book but don't have time or inclination to read the whole thing, we also have a zine out that's chapter two of the book. And that's available on our website as well. And that was put together by Strangers in a Tangled Wilderness, which does a lot of like radical anarchist publishing and graphic design. Really amazing work. Uh, but people can find all that stuff, get to everything from tiltedscalescollective.org. And so definitely the, the book was written exactly for defendants like the ones out in D.C., and it's important to note that people were arrested in D.C., but they actually came from all over. So there are small groups of defendants in, in a number of different cities across the country who constantly are going to have to go back to court facing this really scary situation of up to 10 years in prison. So it's it's a really unprecedented case in certain ways because there's so many defendants, like over 200, who are being charged as co-defendants uh, from the same incident. And it's definitely, like, I'm, I'm not out there. I'm not, not directly involved in that organization. I don't know all the details and all the ins and outs of it, and definitely do not know all the ways that the the criminal courts out in DC work because those courts sound like a complete mess. But it's not a surprising case in the sense that, like, with Trump being in the White House now it makes a lot of sense like why they crack down like so hard in this like really spectacular way. Um, and that's something that the government is able to do so effectively with criminal charges. And so while we wrote the book for people who are in those situations, we weren't trying to write something. It, like, first of all, it's, the book is not a how to guide. It's a way of thinking about criminal charges so that people can figure out what their goals are for their cases and then make decisions from there. And there's two basic ideas in, that are floating around in the background as people think about their charges. One is that handling criminal charges is part of revolutionary struggle and that we can figure out how to do that in ways that will help strengthen our revolutionary struggles. And the other kind of main premise or thought is that however people handle their charges, they should not do so in ways that put other people under the thumb of the state or help the state lock them up in cages. The basic idea there is like, don't snitch. Like, do not provide information on other people to the government. Um, but then the criminal legal system is such a tricky, slippery system, and it's designed to, to trick people and to trap them and to get them to provide information despite themselves and despite their principles. It gets very complicated and much more of a nebulous area as far as like what aiding the state with information can look like. And so while we say, like, you know, don't snitch, we also want to look at making sure that there are things that people are doing or saying in their cases that don't indirectly implicate other people or don't provide the state with leverage over other people. Um, and we can 
talk about some examples to kind of tease that out because it's, it's, it gets very nuanced very quickly. Um, but the, the two basic ideas are criminal charges are part of a revolutionary struggle, and we should handle them as such so that we can strengthen our organizing. And we should do that in ways that don't help the state lock us up. Um, so with with those kind of frameworks like in place, we had this idea to write this book that will be, we hope will be a useful way of helping people think through the charges. And in chapter two, which we have out as a zine, we present this framework that is basically breaking down the overall situation of handling a criminal case in three basic ways or three basic realms. Um, so we break those down and talk about them in terms of goals. And so when people are facing charges, they usually have legal goals in mind and lawyers will mostly be thinking about legal goals. Like what are the lightest consequences that you could possibly receive? What's the lowest fine you can pay? What's the least amount of jail or prison time? You know, those sorts of things. And those can all be totally legit goals, good things to think about, good things to focus on and good things to prioritize at times. And we argue in the book that we should also be thinking in terms of our personal goals and our political goals. So there's three basic uh, areas or realms. And personal can be very similar to legal in a lot of ways, but a lot of times people will have different situations. You know, maybe they have people who are dependent on them, or maybe they have a dire medical situation, or maybe they're trans and need hormones that they won't be able to get in prison. There are lots of different things that would make them need to prioritize or want to prioritize their personal situation over like the legal consequences or the political aspects of their cases. And our argument is like that can also be okay. It can be totally fine to do that as long as people are thinking about handling their cases in ways that can help strengthen the revolutionary struggle and not help the state lock other people up. And our final realm is the political, which we found like is the, the least well-developed in people's thoughts most of the time. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when people are facing criminal charges, for the most part, they're in that situation because the state is using that particular tactic to target them, isolate them, and destroy their organizing and their movements. So it's not a battleground that people choose, it's not a battleground that people like, want to be in. And there are some exceptions to that, people who decide to use the court system to achieve their goals. Um, but for the most part, it's a very reactive defensive position, and it's hard to see how that can be part of our our organizing, our campaigns, our struggles. Um, but we want to, we present a lot of cases from the last like number of decades that show how radicals and revolutionaries have used their, their criminal charges in these political ways to help strengthen their political organizing and achieve those goals. And so we argue that sometimes it's, it makes the most sense and it's the most beneficial to prioritize those goals. And that often means that there will be consequences, legal consequences and personal consequences. But people have chosen to prioritize those goals despite the consequences. And it's useful to do that a lot of times. But in the book, we don't, we don't make arguments about how people should do things or what they should prioritize. We don't have a step-by-step like a -step guide or a method that will like ensure victory. Instead, we present this framework that can help people think very explicitly about these things. And once they determine what their goals are and their priorities and how they balance out with the other goal areas, then our thinking is that they'll be able to make clear decisions about how to handle their cases, how to participate or not with the criminal legal system, how to work or not work with their co-defendants and their lawyers, how to engage with the media or not engage with the media, like all those different decisions can come from that clear understanding and clear prioritization of goals. And we're, our thinking is that that will help people figure out how to handle these situations in ways that can actually benefit us or at least prevent the state from destroying our organizing. Yeah, I really appreciate so, the way that y'all draw it into like a Venn diagram of of those three overlapping spheres and address each one individually. That really, as I was reading through it, I was like, this is a really helpful model or approach to like allowing oneself to prioritize like their thinking and strategize about ways of moving forward. Is that a model that y'all developed yourselves or was that something that's already been tossed around for a bit? Well, one of our collective members had the idea really early on to have the Venn diagram and it's proven to be like such an ingenious thing. Like that was like, a brilliant move on her part. 
Um, so I'm really glad that that it's there and it's it's come, you know, really become a very prominent part of it. And it is like I've gotten such good feedback so far already about how intuitive it is and how useful it is just to see that that structure. Um, as far as developing it, I don't honestly remember exactly how we started thinking in those terms. Um, but the book itself is is collective wisdom, like not just from those of us in Tilted Scales Collective, but from dozens of people across the country. So when we first got the idea for for this book and we had a similar idea for a guide for lawyers about how to work with defendants like this, and that's going to be our next project. So, you know, by the end of this year, hopefully, but we'll see how things go. Um, but we we realized as we were forming the collective that we had a lot of thoughts and opinions and perspectives and experience, but nobody in our collective had faced like really serious charges. None of us had been locked up for any extended period of time. And we didn't have any answers. We had no idea how to change things or how to take away the power of the state to destroy our organizing with criminal charges and with you know prison time and, and all those other things that go along with the prison industrial complex. But we did realize that we knew a lot of people across the country who had a lot more experience and wisdom and insight than we did as a small collective. So we wrote outlines and we sent them out to about 100 people across the country. Um, a lot of those were current and former political prisoners or prisoners of war or politicized prisoners here in the United States. And we got feedback from over two dozen people. And that collective wisdom was what really shaped the book. And so like from all of their responses, all of their thoughts, all of their suggestions and you know some of it was also their uh, their musings like they don't have like answers themselves but they have like a lot of thoughts from especially people who've been locked up for 30 40 years because they're part of you know black liberation struggles for example um, you know we have all of that wisdom that we collected and that like really shaped our thinking and so again i don't really remember exactly how we came up like with this framework but a lot of it was just kind of batting ideas back and forth like amongst ourselves and drawn on this feedback from other people. We wrote the book collectively. So, you know, if, if I were to write a chapter, go first to another collective member for edits and then to another collective member and then come back to me and then we go through another round. Um, so the ideas developed that way as well, like a very collective process, very circular. You make a point in the beginning of like in the introduction of, of stating uh, your, the, that y'all were writing from and are moving from a position that crime is political. Like in the United States framework, and I think in a lot of other countries have been more and more adopting this, um, but the United States doesn't recognize itself as containing political prisoners. Um, it criminalizes the charges that are put up against people that have been involved in, in various liberation struggles. Uh, and that's a... A position that in other countries, liberation struggles or political struggles have had to fight, you know, that I mean, the the blanket men in like Northern Ireland, like former IRA prisoners who were in, I think, Long Cash had to like struggle to reattain the position of a prisoner of war status because of the implications of that towards their national liberation struggle. Um, can you talk about like the the idea of of political prisoners in the U.S. just a little bit, and and the politicization not not the politicization, but the way that y'all approach charges that are brought through the criminal system on prisoners. Yeah. It, so one of our first end notes in the book is about those terms, um, and we also have a sidebar kind of looking at them, like just you know a chunk of text. It's like a side note of sorts, like in, in the chapter. And we found it really important to be very clear about like how we were talking about prisoners uh, for a number of different reasons. One is like, how, how do they define themselves? You know, so radicals and revolutionaries in the U S who have faced charges have done that in a number of different ways and have considered themselves in different ways because of that. So one of those terms is political prisoner. And you're right that the U.S. does not recognize that they have political prisoners. And that is one of the many ways that they create this myth and perpetuate this myth about being, you know, a civilized nation and, um, you know, above all these like totalitarian 
countries and dictatorships and all that. But the truth is that the the U.S. is an imperial power and it's still like one of the strongest like in the world. And it still is a colonial power that has is occupying the stolen lands here in what's called the United States and doing so like through force. And that force works on a systemic level. You see that through, you know, very overt things like, you know, police and prisons. And you see that in much more like covert and subtle ways with you know economic policies that keep particular communities, particularly poor and of color communities, repressed and despondent. Um, so, so in in that sense, a lot of a lot of the people who have been struggling against the United States government have come from those communities that are like repressed in these very systemic, very basic ways uh, that's ultimately supported by white supremacy, that's supported by this imperial and colonial mindset. And those prisoners have have taken different approaches to to working against the government to work to change those conditions and how they handle their criminal charges that resulted. And throughout the the book, we have a lot of different examples of like prisoners who have, have come from those struggles and then gone through and gotten convicted and then consider themselves political prisoners. And that generally means that they were locked up because of their political activity. Uh, Some people who have, kind of come through that trajectory have also totally rejected the authority of the United States government to levy charges, to imprison the people, and even like the the legitimacy of the government itself. So like you, know, you are operating on stolen land, you're like an illegitimate governing body. We like do not recognize your authority. And some of those prisoners have called themselves prisoners of, of war. And that's been some like new African Revolutionaries have taken that approach. Some anti-imperialist, like white anti-imperialist revolutionaries have taken that approach. And Puerto Rican independence fighters have as well. So there's a lot of very inspiring examples. Um, But that has often also included people refusing to participate in their trials, like not going into the courtroom, Uh, sometimes refusing to leave the jail cells, other times refusing to leave the holding cell, like in the courthouse. Um, And other times also like being physically dragged into the courtroom, but then refusing to engage, refusing to participate in the trial, and then basically being convicted um, without their participation. And then there's also prisoners who get locked up who become politicized in a number of different ways. Um, Maybe it's through through reading or through talking or through correspondence with people. Um, And those people like often talk about themselves as politicized prisoners who are, did not end up in, in prison because of political organizing or activity in response to all these conditions that repress communities and and create a class of like prisoners within the broader society. Um, but in some ways as well, like there's a lot to be said for breaking down this idea that there are differences in prisoners that, that you could use like those labels for. And that idea rests on acknowledging how the society is structured to ensure that there are prisoners, that there are people who are doing labor for free. Um, the 13th Amendment like, basically guarantees that that's going to be the case by saying that slavery is still permitted in you know, the so-called United States like after due process of law and a conviction. Um, so with that sense, like the criminal legal system is actually a system that's designed to maintain this group of people who are enslaved, who are doing labor for free, who are suppressed and and um, prevented from accessing like the full like range of like rights and privileges and, and liberties that we're supposed to have, like according to this constitution. Um, and so like that that idea like looks at like how those political processes actually work and how the criminal legal system is a counterinsurgency system that's meant to like to squash any rebellion against the government before it, it begins. And that's not the same as saying that you know that there are not 
people who do harm, who who do horrible things, and that um, there shouldn't be a way of addressing that within society. Um, but instead, that that people who are there, people who get in those situations, who are often like hurt themselves and then go on and hurt other people, like those realities have much more to do with the conditions that the government has created in a systemic way than it does with like the individuals and that ultimately a, a penal system like punishment, incarceration is not the way to deal with those situations and is not the way to prevent them from happening. So before when you were talking about like the book being an approach to attempt to decrease the likelihood that defendants will talk about other people or talk talk to law enforcement or talk to the courts or the judges or what have you, prosecutors, um, and participate actively in endangering other people. Um, you were using the term snitch, and I I don't know if you know this or not, but I have, I have heard from some people that the term has legal implication, and using the term is like there's maybe other other better terms to use rather than snitch because it implicates a level of responsibility or actual actual knowledge of something as opposed to just you know conducting a conversation with a cop and then suddenly you, you get prosecuted because you're like oh yeah I yeah I ran that red light whatever you know, do you know what I mean I guess I'm I'm not saying it very well yeah I I think I understand yeah um snitch is definitely a you know, slang that can be useful, like, you know, shorthand in some ways, but it does run those risk of not being precise and also presenting too simplistic of a view of how cooperation can help the state target other people and, and you know, prosecute other people and lock other people up. Uh, so definitely the, like what we try to do, like we definitely use the term like throughout the book, but like what we're trying to do is talk about it in much more nuanced ways that that really kind of gets at the underlying level of how our like cooperation can hurt other people and hurt like ourselves, and trying to be aware that it it can work in like in very very subtle ways. So there's a a case that we talk about from maybe like eight or so years ago where there's two. Uh, federal co-defendants and they were going to trial separately and one made a statement like on the stand that was intended to like help his co-defendant but because of the way it was worded it actually ended up giving the prosecutor more leverage against the other co-defendant because it contradicted the co-defendant's defense like like his narrative of what happened and like why he was not guilty um, and so unfortunately, like that helped the prosecutor pressure the co-defendant into pleading guilty. And that was like in the, the month before that defendant's uh, second trial. So like the first trial had ended in a hung jury, no verdict, and um, is going to trial again. But in that interim, the prosecutor was able to use the other person's statement to pressure and force a plea agreement. And it, it wasn't it wasn't snitching in the sense that people would often think where um, you know the the first defendant like gave information to help the the state prosecute the other person. It was just the fact that the criminal legal system is designed to trick and trap, and it worked and it worked like very effectively, um, and it worked in ways that as people who are not experts in that system, like we're not going to be able to know all those like ins and outs and all the ways that traps can be laid and all the ways that we can be tricked. But the prosecutors are the experts in that system who do that day in and day out. And they do that to force about 95% of cases across the country um, to be resolved through plea agreements. So they, they do this on the daily and they're good at it. Um, so what we're trying to get at throughout the book is that we can't, assume that we're going to be able to play them or that we're going to be able to beat them at their game because their game is designed to benefit them and they're designed to win that game. Very well put. Thank you. <laughs> um, especially coming from the question that I asked, but um, <laughs> I was like, uh, 
I really appreciate the framing that you as authors provide when when proposing the defendant to be to be honest with themselves, like a point that's driven home from chapter one through chapter nine about surviving prison. Can you talk about lessons learned on the point of of defendants being honest with themselves? Some of the most inspiring feedback that we got from our outlines and mostly from like current and former you know, prisoners was the necessity of being honest with yourself like all the way through um and so i'm glad that you pointed out that it's it, it runs all throughout the book and it's also a super hard thing to do you know even just having like face low level charges myself like nothing super significant it's it's very easy to you know feel like indignation about the situation and hatred for the state and disgust for the whole system and then like when you kind of start going through the the process of of court and all that, then you know things get like much more complicated in your head, and often they can get much more complicated very quickly. And that's also a part of how it's designed to be. It's designed to be overwhelming. It's designed to to feel that it's like incomprehensible and that you can't figure your way out of the situation. And so then the prosecutors, you know, present you with a way out, and that's usually going to be a plea agreement. And it's usually going until ultimately benefit the state, like however, like what the terms are of that plea agreement. But some of the, some of the best feedback we got was about people like just really taking the time to sit and think through like what, like what is their situation? What are they willing to risk or sacrifice? What are they not willing to risk or sacrifice? And to do so like really without judgment of themselves, um, we, we do not need movements that are based on martyrs going to prison. We don't need movements that are based on bravado or machismo or, you know, posturing for people to put themselves forward as you know, the most like diehard revolutionary who will never be cracked or broken. Um, there are a number of people like around the world who, you know, engage in struggle and are horribly repressed and targeted and brutalized and they find the strength to weather those ordeals and to come out like pure, like in their politics. And those people are amazing and inspiring. And I think that all of us individually have a lot of things like that we can learn from their examples. But I think things that like are harder to see is that for the most part, like those people are able to be strong in those ways because of the support that they have, because of the communities that they come from. It's not an individual thing. It's a collective thing. And, when people are looking at their own situations, because of the, the way that the criminal legal system is designed, they're going to have to think in individual terms, and they're going to have to make individual decisions, and they're going to have to figure out how to to find the strength to to push through and to to get through that whole ordeal. But it doesn't have to be something that is an individual, and they shouldn't be thinking about it in terms of like, oh, I'm not strong enough, I'm not good enough, I don't have what it takes to to weather this or to do this. Um, but instead to to just be honest with themselves about where they're at, what they can weather, what they can suffer or sacrifice, and what they can't, and then figure out how to connect with other people to draw on that collective strength to figure things out. Um, again, with these two basic ideas in mind, that like their case is part of that revolutionary struggle and that they can figure out how to handle their case in ways that don't help the state lock other people up. Yeah, it seems... Relatedly, like you tell about people not not just being – despite the court system wanting to individualize people and, and hold hold them as if they're not in this social web or that the court system doesn't exist in this like context of capitalism and white supremacy and colonialism. But it seems like for a defendant, it must be really difficult to balance relationships and safe communication while under investigation or – or while incarcerated in relation to um, possible political prosecution. You all talk really thoughtfully on how defendants might co- might communicate with loved ones, lawyers, media, co-defendants, and such. Um, could you share the importance of, of thinking about that, of, of one's relationships and communication? Yeah, communication, I mean, it sounds like very simple or even like simplistic to say it, but like communication really is one of the most important things uh, that's like happening within a criminal case, uh, and I mean this is always like true, like with relationships and community and and all that, like you know, day in and day out, like there's it's a fundamental thing. Um, but 
the criminal legal system is really designed in a lot of ways to use communication against people. And you see that with like how jails and prisons work to restrict communication, to isolate people. And that's about maintaining control over them and getting them to do what the prisons or what the jails want them to do, um, whether that's you know, free labor or just like not causing problems or um, you know, providing information on other people or all these different goals that they have working simultaneously. But communication is one of the, the basic ways that the state is able to, to control people. And so it, it goes back to the, the fact that the criminal legal system, the courts, and the prison industrial complex, you know, ranging from you know, a holding cell, like once you get arrested, to the county jail, to you know, supermax prison, all of these things are designed to, to capitalize on people's communications in order to target them, to lock them up, to make their conditions unbearable, um, in order to like maintain and achieve like this control. And again, it's like they're really, really good at this. Like the jails are good at this, the cops are good at this, the prosecutors, the police, the prisons, like they're all extremely skilled in doing this. And they've also set up systems to monitor everything so that they're able to gather as much data as possible. And especially if people are locked up pre-trial, like all their communications are being monitored. Um, often, you know, if, if uh, people are facing state charges, but the FBI is interested in them, then their communications, like letters and stuff, like that information will be p- passed on to the FBI as well. That can be used to prosecute people. Maybe within the last six or eight months, there's an uh, article that came, you know, kind of, I, can't remember if it's like whistleblowing or like how the information got out there, but that the, uh, a private like prison phone company whose name is escaping me right now was like recording attorney client phone calls. And those are supposed to be protected and, and private and not something that the prosecutors or the police should be able to listen into or get recordings of, but the company was recording them anyhow. You know, so those things like happen and probably happen like way more than like an investigative like journalist can actually like uncover and so or much less that we could even like prevent from happening in the first place. And so when people are facing charges, it's important to know that like everything is being monitored. Like the repression across the country like depends on everything being monitored. And it's especially easy when people are locked up, but it also happens with social media, it happens with phones. You know, there's been so much in the last number of years about how, like, phones and, you know, even, like, Wi-Fi TVs or Wi-Fi-enabled TVs and different things are able to be monitoring devices and recording devices that the state can just access remotely and record from. And so without, you know, saying that people should be, like, super paranoid or think that, like, there are, they're, you know, constantly there's somebody on the other end of their like, phone just, like, listening in on headphones. It doesn't even have to be that. It's just like that these technologies exist, these capabilities exist, and the state depends on them in order to like maintain that control. So people should be smart and they should be very realistic about those things. And also they need to figure out how to communicate with people who they love and people who support them. And that means taking risks. And they should be smart risks and they should be well-considered risks. Um, but it's much more important, I think, ultimately that people – connect and communicate and strategize and, you know, vent and get, you know, have like those like conversations in the ways that they can, even though that, that entails some risks. Um, Cause there are also risks of being isolated and the state is very good at using the isolation to force plea agreements and to force cooperation as well. So it's, it's risk assessment, it's risk management. Um, but ultimately we're going to be stronger if we figure out how to communicate better with each other. So a tilted guide to being a defendant ranges uh, between individual needs, like we're talking about, and then movement needs and, and collective defense. Why did you all keep coming back to this framework of collective defense? What's the value of collective defense strategies in the court? It's really interesting that you you kind of pulled that out because we are, we are intentional about not going into different ways that people have used like a collective criminal defense because we don't want to two things. We don't want to come across as putting forward a a proposal or like a plan for like how people 
should handle their cases. And we also didn't want to put something down in writing that is like maybe like if, if we saw like a good example of like a collective defense across co-defendants, it may not actually be something that could be done again in a different context, in a different court, like different charges, different people. Uh, it may not be replicable. But we, d- we did, like, as you mentioned, we, we come back to this idea of collective defense. And the, the basic idea there is that the criminal legal system is designed to talk about everything in isolation so that, you know, the, the only context that matters in the court's eyes are the statute that was violated allegedly by this defendant and the consequence that will come like once you know the, their so-called due process of the law happens and somebody is found to be guilty which is preposterous like it's it's like if like anybody who kind of say, takes us back and looks at it it's like there's no way that the context of what's happening in society what's happening with the environment what's happening uh with like you know, the kind of re- renewed overt rise of neo-fascism like in the United States. Like, there's no way that these things are not part of the context and that they don't matter. But in the criminal legal system that is presented that way and the individuals are presented as like, you know, like what happens in your case happens in your case and it affects you and affects you alone. And those things are just ultimately not true. And we found it like very beneficial to challenge that thinking and challenge those assumptions by constantly bringing it back to like, how is an individual situation, how is their case part of this broader struggle? How is it part of a collective experience? Whenever somebody is is like facing charges, there's gonna be interconnections with other people, with other movements, with other communities. And that's actually something that's one of our strengths. And if we can figure out how to handle these like very individualized, very isolating, criminal legal experiences in ways that can prioritize the collectivity and prioritize like the movement in the community. That's what is what's going to help us come out of those situations stronger and ideally have the state come out weaker. You all are currently going on a book tour right now. Can you, can you talk about what spots you're, you're stopping in and what sort of reception you've had? Yeah. So we've been lucky to have a number of events so far. Um, and, so we're, the collective is based in California, so we've done some in um, San Diego and L.A. and Oakland, um, also in Chicago. And in April, we'll be going on the Pacific Northwest tour, so hitting you know, Eugene, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, uh, Olympia, Washington, and Seattle, Washington. And then over summer, we're also scoping out more of a national tour to, to go around different communities, around and the, the tours are a great way of kind of introducing people to the ideas that are in the book and in our zine which is again chapter two of the book um, and having or having conversations with different communities about their struggles about how the, uh, the ideas like the framework can help them think about strengthening their struggles and combating uh, state repression and it's been it's been great to go into different communities and groups and have these conversations and have people's like thoughts and, and feedback on it. Uh, a lot of what we've been hearing so far is that people have never really thought about criminal cases like in this way, and they're really thankful to have like this framework and like the Venn diagram that, that you mentioned before, which is great because like this is, like why we like like took four and a half years, you know, with a number of interruptions from like life and whatever to like write this book and, and get the book published. So the tours are, are a great way of, of doing that. Um, and we're looking to connect with people. So if people want us to come out to you know, their community or come talk with like, the groups, we'll, we want to make that happen as much as possible. People can always connect, connect with us at tiltedscales at riseup.net. And it's a T-I-L-T-E-D. Unfortunately, it's very easy to transpose letters, so it looks like titled scales but it's tilted scales at riseup.net. And we'll be putting out information hopefully pretty soon about your kind of thoughts for going around the country over the summer and connecting with different people and helping to share these ideas and the resources. The book is also a fundraiser. So it, while it helps support Combustion Books, the publisher and AK Press, 
uh, is another anarchist publisher and distributor, so they're distributing it, and people can can purchase the book from them as well. But there's a, a group in Oakland called Prison Activist Resource Center, and it's a uh, PARC, P-A-R-C, and they produce a resource list that like that has resources across the country that they mail to prisoners for free. And so when people like buy the the book, it helps like support that project as well. And this is not something that like anybody is trying to make money on. Having a paper copy of the book is super useful resource. It's a lot easier to read. It's a lot more accessible for a lot of people. But we also have the free ebook that people can find at tiltedscalescollective.org. Um, but the the idea is to get the ideas out there, and hopefully that can help like strengthen the uh, our organizing, our struggles, our resistance overall. And going on tour, doing events is a great way to do that. Also, like people just sharing that information, especially when people pick up new charges, send the the ebook to people who have been released, send paper books to people who are locked up, um, and hopefully it can be a timely resource that will help people fight back. That's really awesome. I didn't realize it was a fundraiser for Park. That's really cool. Also really excited to announce that y'all are going to be presenting at the Asheville Anarchist Book Fair on May 6th, right? Right? Am I right? You are so right. Yes. I'm very excited. Um, you know, it's been it's been a while since I've been out to Asheville, so it's going to be great to go back. And I'm looking forward. It's, it seems like it's going to be a really amazing, like, three-day Anarchist Book Fair. And I'm I'm, I feel like very like honored to be able to go out there and help like present on these ideas and and have the, these conversations and hopefully at that point I'll be like polished enough that I can you know do a good presentation that won't be boring or anything like that. So <laughs> it's I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun. You'll blow the audience away. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, the book is structured in a way that's very personable and very like a. Um, God, I keep always, I always go back to choose your own adventures that just like really defines so much of my childhood, but, um, it's, it's like a great, like literally self-help book approach towards how to think of making plans and moving forward. Um, I, yeah, I think you did a great job of, of addressing the, the tripartite Venn diagram section. Been, been working on that. Well, Jude, thank you so much for taking the time to chat, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. I know. Yeah, it's going to come up fast. Yeah. So uh, thanks for helping me like make that happen, and um, yeah, it's going to be really good. Thanks for all the amazing work that you do. And that was Burst's interview with Jude Ortiz, who is a member of the Tilted Scales Collective and author of the, or one of the authors of the T- A Tilted Guide to Being a Defendant, which is recently out on Combustion Books. You can find more about this project at tiltedscalescollective.org. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw Radio, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Um, also, if you are interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you are free to do so. Just send us an email so we know you're doing it. And if you care to, you can send us snail mail at the Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville, specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.